Hey, we've got a problem here. What did you do? Nothing. I stirred the tanks. Whoa. Hey. Uh, this is Houston. Uh, say again, please. Houston, we have a problem. Welcome back to the Thinking Critical Comic Book Podcast. And it's time to get back into our saving comic book characters and teams uh, segments that we've been doing. Obviously, joined by award winning comic book editor, independent writer, Joe Corrala. How are you doing? I'm all right, Wes. How are you? I'm doing great. So people are enjoying these. We've already saved some key characters. At least we tried to. We saved Wally. We we saved the Avengers. We we tried to save the Teen Titans. Shockingly, the Teen Titans is is the is the video and podcast that people seem to enjoy the most. Like I didn't realize that so many people wanted to see that team saved. But today we're <laughs> going to do our first villain. Yes. So. I am an enormous fan of X-Men. I believe you're an mm -hmm. even bigger fan of X-Men. We are a pretty right big in the fan. middle of, yeah. of Jonathan Hickman's Reign of X, the, the I guess the second chapter of, of Dawn of X. It's the, the part Reign of, of X. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. We've seen Beat Apocalypse it. return to the X-Men universe. He joined the Quiet Council, but now he has departed. And we are going to try and save Apocalypse from Marvel Comics. It's going to be a daunting task because... When you think about the character's origins and what he was created, or how he was created by Louise Simonson, you, know, you, you think you know, Charles Xavier has the dreams of mutants and humans living together. Magneto lives in the reality, according to him, that mutants and humans can never really coexist. Obviously, they're in the same uh, Earth, but they, they really shouldn't be trying to team up. And then you have Apocalypse, the first mutant that believes in mutant supremacy, and that, that mutants will eventually be the, the dominant species and the humans shouldn't even be here. So you have things escalating until you get to Apocalypse. I consider him to like the Thanos of X-Men villains, whereas Magneto is sure. more like Doctor Doom, where he kind of mm -hmm. straddles the line. Yeah, I mean, uh, Apocalypse has always been an interesting character. He was one of my first uh, favorite villains with the X Men when, when I was a kid. I had the yeah you know, the different action figures and uh, uh, loved him in the cartoon. Uh, you know, then when I was older, I went back and and read the comics. Um, you know, created by Wheezy and uh, Butch Geis uh, was the artist who technically created the character, but was mostly fleshed out by Walt Simonson. Uh, throughout Mutant Massacre, um, you know, the fall of mutants. I imagine you know this, but in mm -hmm. issue five of X Force, where we get the introduction of Apocalypse, that was originally by the by the original creator because Louise Simonson wasn't didn't write the first four issues. That was yeah. supposed to be the Owl from Daredevil. That was going to be the villain there, and I believe it was Bob Harris had come in and said. We need a bigger villain that is going to be like the X Force villain, and Louise yeah. Simonson came up with Apocalypse because he said he wanted something really big. Yeah, no that that had um, happened, which which was great, and then the design didn't quite match what what Walt was going for. But but Walt, I mean, completely knocked out of the park. It's very interesting. Uh, a big part of how we even got Wheezy involved in X Men at all was actually Jim Salakrup who took over editing uh, the X books from Roger Stern. And when uh, Jim Shooter hired Wheezy, uh, was asking editors to give up books so she could take them over. And everyone was kind of giving off books that, you know, they didn't necessarily want to deal with, but, but Jim Salakrup actually gave her a, a book that he thought, you know, had a, you know, a tremendous amount of promise with, you know, Uncanny X-Men because he was, busy with the Avengers, Iron Man, Thor, um, books like that at the time. And the X-Men was just so massive. He felt he couldn't really uh, grapple all of that while doing such a, a big section of the Marvel Universe. So he gave that to Wheezy, which is part of how he even got uh, the books to gain the popularity, to get the spinoffs and to get her to a point where she was writing X-Factor. There you go. It's the, the butterfly effect. Jim Salakrup yeah. gives up his spot because he's working in another corner of the Marvel Universe. And we, we end up getting this wonderful, expansive mutant, you know, a uh, series of, of book, mutant focused books in the X-Men universe. Yeah. And uh, it, it was great. I mean, uh, Walt and Wheezy in particular and X-Factor is phenomenal. So one of my favorite uh, 
bits of X-Men. Uh, they'd even, uh, what was it? Uh, Weezy would go on and do X-Factor Forever, which um, is an out of continuity miniseries that uh, she did later on that kind of wrapped up what she would have done with uh, Apocalypse. Um, uh, Apocalypse would obviously go on to become very popular through you know Age of Apocalypse. Uh, a lot of people think of that uh, when they think of Apocalypse. Um, That's like was, the greatest Marvel what if story ever. It, it's certainly like the most expansive uh, that that just I like took over everything. Marvel or DC wish that they could execute something like Age of Apocalypse. Nobody sees it coming. And then one week, all of your X-Men books are replaced with alternate versions with different titles. And you're in a completely different timeline. And you're trying to play catch up. And what the hell just happened to the X-Men line? And you didn't even know if it was going to go back. Yeah, it's so it's so interesting because then we ended up getting like little bits that just kept coming back. Like Dark Beast, for whatever reason, was uh, very popular and would just keep coming into our universe. Um, Sugar Man, oddly enough, out of all the characters from Age of Apocalypse, would uh, you know come back. Uh, even the um, you know Age of Apocalypse uh, Nightcrawler for a bit in uh, Uncanny X Force. Uh, which obviously draws a lot from Age of Apocalypse and Apocalypse-related things. But but yeah, uh, Apocalypse was a uh, really threatening villain for a while uh, through the early 90s, through Executioner Song. Uh, you'd have Age of Apocalypse. It kind of died down, got rid of him. Uh, he became more popular again in, in the past decade or so um you know coming back i believe it was an x-force that he came back in and um then through uncanny x-force with uh you know the kid apocalypse the uh evan uh sabanor and, and then we were just plagued with that character for a while but um one interesting thing that i always think about when i think of apocalypse for whatever reason unlike other characters um you know, Apocalypse is supposed to be a, a character who is born uh, in, in, I believe it's Jordan. So he, you would think, would either be portrayed as uh, Black or Middle Eastern, you know, depending on what, you know, exactly where in Jordan, where the parents came from, all that. So this is a character who is voice acted mostly by, by white guys. Uh, Oscar Isaac is, uh, I believe, uh, from Guatemala, or um, this lineage is from Guatemala, and no one gets upset about that for whatever reason. There are other things that people will get upset about in terms of casting, in terms of representation, but for whatever reason, Apocalypse is a a above all that, and it's it's because he it's was weird. born and you know he had used his own color already, and I believe, sure, I think his parents might have, or maybe his village made him an outcast and finally yes. someone saw the potential in uh in um Samanur and it brought him out so Absolutely. i do think marvel marvel did some interesting things with apocalypse to make him really important and elevate him uh, one interesting thing I, I think was when they essentially sacrificed like warren worthington to apocalypse mm -hmm. had angel essentially one of the original x-men one of the mm -hmm. founding members Almost like the symbol of hope, the, the character that couldn't be turned, that always had a, had a hopeful outlook. And then when when uh, Apocalypse raised him up and made him one of his four horsemen, and he oh, became yeah. Archangel, it, it kind of destroyed the psyche of several mutant mutants within the X-Men universe that they couldn't believe the symbol of hope was had turned evil. I think that's an effective way to really make Apocalypse stand out. Oh yeah, that's it's one of my favorite storylines from the Fall of the Mutants uh, is you know having him become Death Angel and, and then uh, redeeming himself and being Archangel after that. But the 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 key to like Wheezy and, and how she would write is everything had a lot of heart to it. Uh, there was a lot of uh, emotional investment in these characters, so she was able to pull off. The, these kind of things, you know, um, taking a character also like Caliban and, you know, having Apocalypse twist him as well. Um, it, it's It's been interesting, because especially when you, you read like Mutant Massacre and they still didn't quite have Apocalypse down. So he's, 
it's a little goofy. He's just this like kind of like weird character in the background who's like pulling the strings and, and trying to bring people in, setting up the fall of the mutants more or less uh, when he would get his horsemen. But it's it's interesting uh, how by the fall of the mutants he is this incredibly dangerous uh, villain, and and they really were able to keep that for a long time. And then part of where it all falls apart, it's not necessarily through initial bad stories. It's like I was saying before with Uncanny X-Force and and having Kid Apocalypse and all of that. Uncanny X-Force was handled really well. The problem is afterwards, now we're stuck with this Kid Apocalypse that initially was killed he he had uh phantom x just execute kid apocalypse but in a very shocking yeah. moment because that yeah. was supposed to be the the moral conundrum you know essentially if you if you could go back in time and baby hiller was there what would you do you know is is his destiny already set in stone apparently phantom x says so according to rick remender i, I imagine rick remender probably had further stories and, and ideas that he wanted to go along with i know he had pitched a follow-on X-Men series afterwards that didn't get picked up. But you're right, yeah. somebody else has to kind of pick up the ball and run with it. Yeah, and unfortunately, and again, I'm not I'm not trying to knock anyone or anything because these these ideas might seem sound good in paper. Uh, maybe they could have been executed better, but then we got stuck with Kid Apocalypse and Wolverine and the X-Men. And it was goofy. And we got the the goof the goofification of of apocalypse for a long time uh was just this kind of goofy uh character of uh, you know evan uh sabinor uh, genesis all through you know uh age of x-man and now he's now he's gone but but for years we were plagued with goofy stupid kid apocalypse which kind of just chipped away at the character a lot and this was also during a time where if we all step back and look, there was this like weird decade or so where Marvel just kept taking threatening characters and turning them into kids that had to reflect on how awful they became. With um, We got that with Kang the Conqueror and Young, uh, Young Avengers, Loki in Journey into Mystery, uh, you know, Kid Apocalypse. And then we also got that with the time travel, uh, you know, original X-Men with like teen Cyclops. It's very weird. Like when you actually step back and look at that, that's way too many characters to be doing that in a short period of time. And DC kind of picked up the ball and ran with it too. I believe they made Dark Side a baby. Yep. <laughs> it's like, why is this? I remember playing Mortal. Was it Mortal Kombat when you did the Babality and the, you know, Babality, you yeah. turned the character into a little baby? But mm-hmm. I didn't want to say that in a movie or a comic book. No, <laughs> it's supposed um, to be funny. <laughs> Dark Side also had other problems where um, basically I'm. I, I, I'm really just dumbing this down. I, I know this isn't exactly what happened, but basically Superman defeats Darkseid with a song. So we're uh, we're already dealing with that. But <laughs> it's uh, but yeah, then we get that, and then we go from goofy kid apocalypse to emo dad apocalypse in Hickman's X Men, where he's a sad dad who just wants to like be with his wife and kids again and it's very weird it is very weird it's to take a character with the motivations that have been firmly established and these aren't recent motivations these are motivations that have been you know essentially you know obviously the comic book doesn't go back thousands of years but the history of the character goes back thousands of years sure and it's been firmly established and that's what he's been moving towards is like mutant supremacy you know survival of the fittest even if you're a weak mutant, he doesn't want that either. You know, he's he's got some yeah. crazy like eugenic uh, you know, philosophies about what he wants the world to be and and what Apocalypse's world would look like. I just find it so strange that you would try and take that character and make him sympathetic to where it, yeah. he wasn't the bad guy all along. His wife. And his horsemen were stuck on the other side defending our our world. And he knows that he has to go back with an army to to help them. He just wants to save his wife. Like, I just want my kids back. Like, it's yeah. very, it's, 
it's so goofy. It's like thinking about that and, and, and thinking of things like, did Apocalypse used to celebrate his anniversary? Like, did he get his kids a bike? Like, what the hell is this, you know, that they're trying to do? It, it's very weird, very uh, destructive to the character. Um, you know, I, I'm, well, it's I'm also sure... destructive to Charles. To think yeah. about Charles, a character who knows what his motivations are and what Charles wants, even if it's changed dramatically due to his knowing what the future holds. Sure, like you, it's it's hard to imagine that he could his moral fiber could change to such a degree that not only would he embrace Apocalypse, bring him on Krakow, then get him a seat at the table at the Quiet Council as one of the three main heads. Yeah, and, and Apocalypse, it's never really been made too clear, and, and people have different interpretations of the character over the years, where Apocalypse has been described as uh, Apocalypse is to mutants, what mutants are to people, that he is the next stage in evolution, but then also he's not because he's a mutant on Krakoa. Like, there, there's a lot of weird uh, inconsistencies with the character. And adding more silly things like being married with children doesn't help uh, clear a lot of this you know, stuff up. You haven't seen Apocalypse cry? Yeah. Like, why is this, this is like the first mutant, the strongest mutant. He's, he's in, you know, bored, you know, he is insane. And here he is crying yeah. tears. Ugh. Yeah, it, it, yeah. Overall, just very destructive stuff to the to the character, and may, maybe there is going to be a, a, a great payoff, and, and we're all going to be eating crow. And I, I am more than happy to to eat crow in this situation. I would love that the next time I, I pick up these books, I'm like, they got me. It was it was all worth it. I don't know how they did it. I can't in my mind figure out how that would happen now, but I I am all for it. If uh, if Apocalypse just shows up at the gal and murders everybody, great. Now we're talking. Um, there we go. But, um, you know, or or maybe Apocalypse's, you know, uh, Met Gala look is going to be so good, it's all going to be worth it. <laughs> it's going to be so fierce, it's not even funny. Yeah. To open it up, I'm like, I, I got to get that outfit. I, yeah. Going back to Korea, where the tailors were. Going to get some gonna custom... Get Custom digs. <laughs> Get right on Etsy and, and see if people threw, uh, threw some uh, outfits on there based on it. You never know. Um, but There's yeah, some other, yeah. other issues before this I, I did want to bring up. <laughs> At course. this point, he's he saved the world too many times. Sure. You know, every once in a while, maybe, you know, something happens and Thanos, it's in his best interest this one time to, to maybe intervene on his enemy's behalf or... But it's really happened a lot of times. Even I think they went back and like the origins of Shield may have been in like Egypt, and he maybe he helped out the original like Shield back in the day, to, <laughs> like fending off an alien invasion, silly stuff like that. And it's like, yeah, why is he saving the Earth? He's he's not into humans. He thinks no. they should be gone anyway. He he's not even in 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 certain interpretations of the character. Uh, he's not even that partial to mutants. If if someone else comes along, yeah. yeah. If someone else comes along and proves that they're better than mutants, he's all for that person. So why would he stop an alien invasion if you know we're gonna find out who the best of the best are? I can't imagine a gauntlet to, to, to determine who the survival of the fittest is than a tech, technologically advanced alien race coming down and laying waste. Yeah, no, it, it, it makes very little sense. Uh, it, it, there are certain characters like Galactus where he's so above humanity, they're ants to him, that it's easier to persuade someone like him to not care because, again, they're ants. You know, it's like, oh, who cares? What, whatever you want. And, and he's a character who has a certain moral code. And if he uh, gives you his word, that he's going to not do something, he keeps it. That's not the kind of character Apocalypse is. So it's very weird when when we see Apocalypse handled in, in ways like that. It's definitely lost his like ruthless edge. Yeah. And I think that was that's like the the fabric or the foundation of the character. 
Yeah, and there's plenty of other villains or villainous characters that have a ruthless edge or or don't have a ruthless edge rather that you can use instead of Apocalypse. But unfortunately, uh, one of the biggest obstacles X-Men's had for a long time is every villain becomes their best friend. And that's really come to a head now where every mutant with very few exceptions are everyone else's best friend. And it's, yeah. like Namor, right? That's the only one I can think of. It's Namor. Uh, Sebastian Shaw now has enemies in, you know, Kitty and all that. It's Mr. Sinister is up to something like, like there's a, yeah, a few things the going on. Yeah, no, exactly. <laughs> so it's like, there, there's a few outliers, but for there only being a few outliers, when you're dealing with an entire island of millions of people, that's not good for conflict and, and for, for storytelling purposes there. Yeah, it's, it's, it's become quite the conundrum. So we, we've talked about most of these. Like the, the biggest obstacles I can see are the edge has been taken off the character. He's saved humanity too many times. It doesn't really fit who the character is. And at this point, in time, at, at this moment, he's been made far too sympathetic. His motivations have been com completely altered to where he's, you know, he's supposed to be one of the good guys. And it, it doesn't really fit with the character. No. So I personally, I will do my best. I am just a schlub. I am not a professional writer. <laughs> I'm certainly not an award-winning editor. <laughs> I'm just a guy here, you know, bouncing some ideas. I found this one more difficult. But I sure. say you just kind of go with, got to go with where we're at, right? Uh, certainly Jonathan Hickman's X-Men line, his time as head of X, isn't ending, ending anytime soon. I don't see them rebooting the X-Men anytime soon. Mm -hmm. So this just has to be a big ruse that yeah. you know, Apocalypse requested Arako come back with a million of, of battle-hardened mutants you know, to come through the breach, be be next to uh Krakoa. He's gone back through through the portal with, with his uh, wife, I believe her name is Genesis, and his four horsemen there in Amon to raise an even bigger army. And they're gonna come in yeah. and they're gonna try to wipe out the X-Men. I think that's like the best way to go through it is to return him to his roots yeah. and, and have a survival to fit us. It's certainly not a no no tournament of champions though. That's off the top. Yeah. No, absolutely. That's that's certainly one way to do it, um, that it was a ruse. Um, there, there's only so many things you can do, I think, and, and that's absolutely one of them. That was a ruse. It was a trick. I want the Red Wedding at the Hellfire Gala, and then that would subvert all expectations. You'd get Apocalypse back on track. He'd wipe out a bunch of the key mutants, and you'd have some really gnarly conflict. The only problem is you could yeah. resurrect. Sure. You, you, for you now. Take out the five. <laughs> yeah, Apocalypse could take out the five. Um, yeah. You know, something like that. Maybe he's been working with, um, you know, it would be great. Uh, again, the, the problem is we're all going to end up thinking of uh, better things than we actually read, which is a shame. But um, if he, he and Sinister was, you know, should be working together because Sinister has the ability to make even better mutants with his Chimera program. Yeah. That we know he's going to do in the future. So you, could, you definitely need to have some type of of thing there like he would never kill sinister because he would be too useful for him. him and sinister uh working together is, is something him and mystique working together um Absolutely. i i think uh striking a deal with mystique where she comes in um and allows apocalypse the access he needs to execute who he needs to execute to take over the five and bring destiny back that's that's something um maybe apocalypse could be colluding with uh, moira that's that's another uh good potential that was that one of my theories because mm -hmm. in one of the, the timelines she becomes the disciple of apocalypse yeah and when she dies like the next timeline is when she tells charles you know hey this is all the stuff that i thought well perhaps you know, because she won't let him scan her mind anymore because after that is when she's approached Apocalypse and like, listen, this is the plan that we hatched up in another life. You don't know about it yet, but this yeah. is what we're going in. I can't let Charles ever look at my mind again. Yeah, that could that could be really explosive and, and really great. 
Um, we we need that. Apocalypse desperately needs that like heel turn to get to get his groove Absolutely. back here. Um, that's that has good to good old fashioned yeah. heel turn, baby. Yeah, that's something like that. Hogan moment. <laughs> yeah, we desperately need that for for a villain like Apocalypse. Apocalypse needs to be reasserted as a villain. He needs to be asserted as a threat, not just to the X Men, but the entire Marvel universe. He's worth it. It's weird that Apocalypse, as powerful as he is, hasn't really been featured as like the main antagonist in like some epic all-inclusive every marvel character kind of event in in the way you would think a character like him would be um so that would be really interesting to see if they could escalate this and and really push uh hickman's x-men into being this sort of uh line-wide event uh, with with apocalypse uh, coming to reclaim all of Earth with uh, the disciples of uh, you know um, God what is it uh, Ak God why am I blanking on the you know because the the other island Acro uh, um, yeah. yeah so yeah we need something and this isn't an apocalypse problem this I think is a Jonathan Hickman's X Men line problem is. We've had all yeah. these big ideas have been introduced. They've mm -hmm. been talked about a little bit. But there hasn't been a lot of payoff other than the Four Horsemen story. Obviously, that did did include Apocalypse, but sure, you know, you've you've got um, you got Nimrod sitting out there. You you've got Warrior X sitting out there. Mm -hmm. You got Sabretooth sitting underneath the island. You've got Destiny that that they won't resurrect and bring back, even though um, now I'm forgetting names. <laughs> now it, it mystique, happens yeah mystique mm -hmm. knows where nimrod is coming from she she opted not to end the program at that moment so yeah. you've got all these dominoes set up and it, it's time to, to to make them fall yeah it's uh it's uh, we we are all more than ready we've, we've been waiting for a long time this has been going on for i think a lot of people would agree too long and it's time that something massively explosive happens where all these dominoes fall and apocalypse uh, really needs to be at the center of a lot of this to make it all click. All right. So I think that, that one works within the world that we're currently in with Jonathan Hickman's X-Men. Sure. Now, when we talk about Wally West, I did my best to work within the frame of what we had. You mm -hmm. said, screw it. Just yep. reset the whole thing and act like it never happened. Yeah. Well, it just so happened at that point in time with what DC Comics had done with, with Dark Knight's <laughs> Death Metal and, and Future State, they went with your option. They were able to, to execute that. Now, is there any other way that you could see that Marvel could could really get Apocalypse back to where it needs to be? An enormous Thanos-level, cosmic-level, not really cosmic because he's not from space, but that sure. type of threat where he's a threat to everything and really get the character back to his roots. Yeah, I, I mean, uh, you could do something as simple as this is not the real apocalypse. This is uh, this is a clone. This is a Imposter. shell. Yeah, and uh, that it's was sent Evan. out. Yeah, it happened all along. <laughs> it has been happened. And uh, yeah, do something like that. And the real apocalypse has been dormant. The real apocalypse has been waiting. The real apocalypse is uh, in stasis on ship. You know, there there's a, a, multiple things they could be doing um, that that could set that sort of storyline up because um, if, if that's the case and this, we haven't been dealing with the real apocalypse and this is a flawed uh, clone or flawed shell that has uh, more human emotions and flaws and, and the real, like just horrific uh, purely Darwinian apocalypse has been uh, dormant uh, waiting to return. Great. I'm down for that. Let's do it. Yeah, like Charles is the one that did it, though. Like he came up with this big master plan, and got all the the pieces in place, and you replace that that apocalypse with one that could be kind of his patsy apocalypse that Ooh. he could get all the villains to come inside with him on Krakoa. And Charles yep. was the evil one all along. There you the, go. Could be that apocalypse probably needs to come and deal with. Yeah, or thank you, know... you for doing all my work, Charles. I'll take my army now. Yeah, maybe maybe Charles is so powerful now because of the stupid thing he wears on his head, 
that uh, <laughs> this isn't even apocalypse. He created from his mind such a powerful projection of, of apocalypse that uh, that's been what's going on. Yes. The days of, of negotiating with the UN, crying tears and cutting down teenage mutants so they could be resurrected. Actually, that probably fell in line with Apocalypse, right? You need your powers back. Let me kill you with my big ass sword. It kind of, yeah. That felt like an Apocalypse moment when they're in the, in the arena. You remember that one? Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. When uh, they, they introduced the idea that Nightcrawler was going to create his own mutant religion. But they need to bring him back because I don't know. Doc probably calls him Dad Apocalypse. Yeah. He, yeah, yeah he's a little funny. too soft in the belly now. A little bit. He's, uh, you know, it's a little. A little bit that little little emo um <laughs> you know a little you know uh he's uh you know writing poetry on his dead journal you know that that kind of stuff but we need we definitely not only do we need a a, a powerful ruthless apocalypse back we need villains that the x-men fight that we believe are a threat it's hard to imagine there being much of a threat to krakoa when it's you know this nation of millions of powerful mutants that can't die, the villains are United Nations. Yeah, and then I guess it's Zeno, but we haven't seen that that team in like six or seven months. Yeah, it's been so long, and it's plant people. Yeah, it's. I know, uh, I know you love plant people. Oh yeah, who doesn't who doesn't love plant people? But but yeah, there's nothing that's really. Uh, that, that feels like it could be a, a problem unless they, you know, drag out remnants of the Shi'ar Empire again and the yeah. brood. I mean, I think we're getting the brood and sword. Um, yeah, it's a dim rod and then it's the phalanx, really, but the phalanx yeah. is supposed to be a long ways off. Yeah. So, I so, don't know. Those yeah. are our ideas about Apocalypse. Great character. It seems to have lost his way. Interesting enough, when you think about Thanos, when they went and redid his origin, I think it was was that Jason Aaron with Thanos Rising? I think so, yeah. That was like one of the a, more gra- no. I think it was Thanos Rising with Jason Aaron. That's like one of the more graphic stories like in Marvel history. Like he's he's a serial killer since the age of like 12. Yeah. But it, it all it did was make him like even more evil. Whereas they've kind of gone back in time with with Apocalypse yeah. and made him less evil. It's okay. Go back to the other for... approach. It's okay for a villain to be evil and threatening. Like, really, it's it's fine. I'm I'm more than happy to read about an actual evil villain that has to be stopped by by superheroes. It's it's okay to do that sometimes. All right, Joe. I want to say thanks for helping me try to save Apocalypse, and I guess we'll do a, a DC villain next week. I, I know everyone's going to want us to do Harley Quinn, but let's see what we can come up with. Maybe it is Harley. Yeah, I, I mean, it might be Harley, but there's there's a lot of uh, potential characters there, so we'll 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 chew on it a bit, and we'll we'll think of something. 